In this section, we'll look at a few different properties of determinants, and this will lead us up to the next section, which is a big section on applications of determinants. So let's look at a couple of different ways that determinants behave. Suppose I've got this matrix A. Matrix A is the matrix 1, 4, 7, 3. And matrix B is the matrix 2, negative 1, 0, 3. So I want to find the determinant of matrix A. All right, we know how to do that. It's a 2 by 2. 1 times 3 is 3. 4 times 7 is 28. Subtract the 2, and the determinant of matrix A is negative 25. The determinant of matrix B, 2 times 3 is 6. Negative 1 times 0 is 0. So the determinant of matrix B is 6. Suppose I multiply the two matrices together. All right, so we do row 1 by column 1, so I do 1 times 2 plus 4 times 0, so my first entry is 2. Then I do 1 times negative 1 and 4 times 3, so that's 12 minus 1, gives me 11, that goes in the first row, second column. All right, 7 times 2 is 14, 14 plus 0 is 14, and then I get negative 7 plus 9 is 2. So there's the product matrix AB. Suppose I want the determinant of the product matrix. Well, I would take 2 times 2, which is 4. 14 times 11 is 140 plus 14 more, 154. So 4 minus 154, the determinant of matrix AB is negative 150. Now, you notice the one matrix has a determinant of negative 25. The other has a determinant of 6. Negative 25 times 6 is equal to negative 150. It turns out that this is not a rule that works only in this case. It works in all cases. And that is the determinant of a product of two matrices is actually the product of their determinants. And actually, the numbers on the right-hand side can go in either order, right? The determinant of AB can also be the determinant of B times the determinant of A because these are both numbers. So in this case, the determinant of AB was negative 150. That's the same thing as saying negative 25 times 6. So this is a rule for determinants. The determinant of a product is the product of the determinants. All right, let's take a look at another case that might be interesting. Let's take a look at matrix A as the matrix 10, 20, 30, negative 10. All of these things are products that are, could be multiplied by 10. So why don't we take a 10 out of row 1? So I'm going to take a 10 out of row 1, and I'm going to take a 10 out of row 2, which gives me the matrix 1, 2, 3, negative 1. All right, let's call that matrix B. For matrix A, the determinant of matrix A is going to be 10 times negative 10 minus 20 times 30. So negative 100 minus 600 gives me negative 700. Look at the determinant of matrix B. The determinant of matrix B is going to be 1 times negative 1 minus 2 times 3. So negative 1 minus 6 is negative 7. To get back that determinant of matrix A, I would have to multiply 10 times 10 times the determinant of B to get the determinant of A. So in other words, if I did in the other direction, if I started with the 1, 2, 3, negative 1, and multiplied that matrix by 10, then I would have to multiply the outside of that determinant by 10 to whatever power is the same as the number of rows. So suppose I've got a matrix A, that's an n by n matrix, and C is some scalar, then the determinant of the scalar times the matrix is going to be that scalar raised to the number of rows that I have times the determinant of A, right? By the way, these rules don't work for matrix addition. The determinant of A plus B is not the determinant of A plus the determinant of B for all cases. I'm sure you can find some cases where it does work, but does it work for all cases? No. So it works for multiplication, does not work for addition. What good is a determinant then? Well, one thing that might be interesting is what happens when the determinant is zero? 
it turns out if the determinant is zero, there is no inverse. So if the determinant of a matrix is zero, then the inverse does not exist. Go back to the two by two case. So in the two by two case, matrix A is A, B, C, D. We know that the determinant of matrix A is A, D minus B, C. Now, how do we find the inverse of a two by two matrix? The inverse of a two by two matrix is one over the determinant and then we flip-flop things around. So the D comes on top, the A goes on the bottom, and then we switch the two signs going the other way. Well, if this value is zero, if the determinant is zero, then there's no inverse because I can't multiply the matrix by one over zero. So that's one thing that it tells me is that if the determinant is zero, there is no inverse. What do we call a matrix that does not have an inverse? We call it a singular matrix. Okay, singular matrix means there's no inverse. Non-singular means there is an inverse. You could say it another way, too. Suppose that I looked at a matrix times its inverse. You know that a matrix times its inverse gives you the identity matrix. Well, I should be able to take determinants of both sides. So if I take the determinant of the product, that's the same as the product of the individual determinants. Well, the identity matrix has a determinant that's one, right? Because if I multiply down the diagonal of the matrix, we know that that determinant is going to come out to be one. Well, it's impossible for then either of these to be zero. If you know the two things are one, then neither of these can be zero. It can't be zero because if you multiplied a number times zero, you would not get one. It's also true, by the way, looking at this, that I can come up with another fact, which is that if I multiply two things together to be one, they must be reciprocals of each other. So if you want to find the determinant of A, the determinant of A inverse must be the reciprocal. Because if I multiply those two things together, I get one. Another way of saying this is that the determinant of A inverse is one over the determinant of A. All right, you like to write it out this way. You can. The determinant of A inverse is one over the determinant of A. Now, how does that help us? That means that if we want to find the determinant of the inverse of a matrix, then we don't necessarily have to find the inverse of the matrix unless we needed it for some other reason. Finding the inverse of a matrix can be sort of a laborious process. What if we just needed the determinant of the inverse? If you knew the determinant of the matrix, then just take the reciprocal and you're done. So it should save you time if you understand that concept. So for example, let's take a look at this matrix A. Matrix A is the matrix 0, 2, negative 1, 3, negative 2, 1, 3, 2, negative 1. Okay. Here's the question. Is this matrix A singular or non-singular? Well, to do that, you need to find the determinant of the matrix. If the determinant of the matrix is zero, then the inverse doesn't exist. So find the de determinant of matrix A. All right, so I'm going to do zero times, knock out row one and column one. I get negative two, one, two, negative one, minus two times three, one, three, negative one, and then plus negative one times, now knock out row one, column three and I get three, negative two, three, two. All right, doesn't matter what that determinant is, I'm gonna get zero minus two times negative three minus three, which is negative six, and then minus one times six minus a negative six. This gives me 12 minus 12, the determinant is zero. 
if the determinant is zero, then there's no inverse. So because the determinant equals zero, that means there's no inverse. And what name do we give that? We say it's a singular matrix. Singular matrix because it doesn't have an inverse. All right, let's look at another one. Let's look at matrix A as the matrix 1, negative 3, 0, negative 2, 4, 1, 5, negative 2, 2. And here the question is find the determinant of A inverse. Now we could go through that process where we put A on one side, we put the identity matrix on the other side, and then we row reduce until we get the identity matrix on the left side and A inverse on the other side, and then find the determinant of A inverse. But we can save that whole process by simply finding the determinant of A and then taking the reciprocal. So let's see if we can find the determinant of A. I'm going to do 1, and then the 2 by 2 is going to be 4, 1, negative 2, 2. You might even try row reducing this a little bit to make the numbers a little bit easier. If you can get yourself some zeros over here, then that might make the calculations a little bit easier. Or we could stick with the standard form. Now, just remember, the second one is going to be minus a negative 3, so it's going to be plus 3. And then you'll end up with a negative 2, 1, 5, 2. And this is not bad because then the third one is zero times. It doesn't matter here because it's still going to be zero. All right, four times two is eight minus a negative two. Here I'll get negative four minus five. And so this gives me 10 plus three times negative nine. Negative 27 plus 10 is negative 17. So the determinant of matrix A is negative 17. Question asks for the determinant of A inverse, so that's easy. If you know what A is, the determinant of A inverse is 1 over the determinant of A. So I get 1 over negative 17. That's the determinant of A inverse. So I was able to figure that out without ever figuring out the inverse. All right, let's talk about transposes for just a second. Remember, a transpose interchange rows and columns. So if I look at a transpose, suppose matrix A is the matrix 4, 3, 7, 1. That makes a transpose equal to 4, 7, 3, 1, like that. Well, what's the determinant of A? The determinant of A is 4 minus 21, negative 17. What's the determinant of a transpose? It's 4 times 1 minus 7 times 4. That's ah, the same thing. Because switching the rows and columns doesn't switch the items on the diagonal. The 4, the 1, the 7, and the 3 are still on the diagonal. You're just switching the order that you multiply them, which doesn't make a difference. So the determinant of a is the same as the determinant of a transpose. And the only other thing to mention in this section is the equivalence conditions theorem. Remember we had done one a few sections back where we started with the matrix is invertible, therefore AX equals B has a unique solution, AX equals zero has only the trivial solution, and so forth. Well, we're going to add one thing to there. So I'm not going to rewrite the whole equivalence theorem. The only thing you should know is that the equivalence theorem that starts with A is invertible now adds a number six, which is that the determinant of A is not zero. And so what does that mean? That means if the determinant is not zero, then AX equals B has a unique solution. In other words, you can't do that A inverse B equals X if the inverse doesn't exist. So if the determinant is not zero, then you can solve those types of problems by doing A inverse B. If the determinant is zero, then you're not going to be able to solve it that way. So take a look at the equivalent conditions theorem for non-singular matrices in the textbook, and you'll see there's six different conditions there. Um, starting with the matrix is invertible, we now add the fact that the determinant can't be zero. Right, in the next section, we'll take a look at all different applications of determinants.